Well, good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. I'm Randy Caulfield. I'm, I'm the lead pastor here at River Church. And in just a, just a few hours, we'll be worshiping here together. But right now, I want to worship with you. Those of you who are not yet ready to get out, you're continuing to worship at home. That's why we produce these, uh, these worship videos every week, because we love you and we want you to be a part of our service. Now listen, today, communion is going to be at the end. Once you turn off the video, and, and you're going to understand that everything we're doing in, the, in our teaching time points to that. So I encourage you to get your elements ready, some kind of bread and some kind of juice so that we can celebrate, you can celebrate right there in the privacy of your own home. But again, it's going to be a little different right after the, the, the sermon, right after the video is over. So you'll understand that. So get that ready, get rid of your distractions, fill up your coffee cup, uh, get something to write with and a, pen, uh, a notepad and your Bible, and we'll get rolling here in just a minute. Welcome to week four of our teaching series titled The Great Exchange a walk through the stories of the Bible. This phrase, the great exchange, it is a phrase that I, I believe well represents God's interaction with humankind throughout history, throughout the history of the Bible. The great exchange. Now each week as we begin, I like to talk about one great exchange that I've experienced in my own uh, life and and so I'm I'm gonna eventually gonna run out but here it is week four and I've got another one. Uh, many years ago, Lydia and I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we were young and married and had one kid and uh, we lived in this this small old home that was just a delightful home. It had built been built by a, a man named Mossman and so that neighborhood and those those homes in that area were called Mossman homes and people loved the homes. We loved the home. Small but it had hardwood floors. Just a delightful home. But it needed to be painted. Uh, the trim and the woodwork on the outside needed to be painted. And so I d devised a plan as to how I could get someone to exchange painting my home for something that I had. You see, I had this, this set of, uh, of old golf clubs that uh, I didn't want anymore. I didn't plan to use anymore. Uh, and I, I, I happened to find a young man uh, just graduated from high school. It was the summer before he was going off to college. And he wanted a set of golf clubs. Now, if I was his parents, I would have said, what you really need, son, is money because you're going to college. But anyway, he needed or wanted golf clubs. I wanted my house painted. So we made this great exchange, and he spent quite a few weeks painting, meticulously painting, I might add, the house. And at the end of uh, the, the house painting, I gladly said, here you go. Here are your, here's, here's your set of golf clubs. And I really felt like I came out pretty well on that deal. I got my house painted and he received himself a set of golf clubs and it was a, a great exchange of sorts. But the greatest exchange that's ever happened uh, is found in the Bible. It is when Jesus exchanged my sinfulness, the guilt of my sin. He exchanged that for his righteousness. We find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, for our sake God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the, the debt of my sin on the cross was placed on Jesus. So, so he bore the penalty, what I deserved. And, and then in exchange, I received, though I didn't deserve it, I received the righteousness of Christ. And that, my friends, is the story of Bible. That, my friends, is the gospel story. And yes, it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the letters of Paul, but it's also in the, the Old Testament. It's all over every page of every chapter of every book in the Bible. The gospel story, the great exchange. Now, I see two main hurdles to our faith uh, relevant to what I just said. Two hurdles that I know many people who... They, they, they think they might want to believe in Jesus, but just two hurdles that they find really hard to clear. Uh, one is the idea that I have a debt of sin that I owe. I have people tell me, and I just I have a hard time believing that just everybody's guilty and everybody's walking around guilty and, 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 and everybody's got this, this penalty or this, this debt that they owe because of their sin, because of their wrongdoing. There's a second faith hurdle that I believe is, is, is hard for people to clear, 
And it goes something like this. It says, okay, if we are uh, guilty, but we're sinners, uh, I have a hard time believing that God expects us to, to, to make payment on that. To, to, why, why, why do we have to, why do we have to pay, pay down that debt? Why does it have to be, why can't there just be forgiveness? Why does somebody have to die for that debt? And I hope to address those two hurdles today as we are uh, week four of the Great Exchange. We are talking about um, specifically the mystery of the Passover meal. The Passover meal. You may or may not know what I'm talking about, but, but, but this, this Passover meal, uh, as we look at it today, it's actually central to the story and the belief system of, of, of two of the, the world's great religions, uh, Judaism and Christianity, the Passover meal. We read about it in the Old Testament. It bleeds over into the New Testament. Uh, maybe you've been invited to some sort of a Passover uh, meal in, in, in your life. But we're going to talk about that today. Okay, let's read the passage. It's Genesis chapter 12. We're finally into... Uh, Moses and Pharaoh and the plagues, the parting of the sea and all that stuff. The next few weeks we're going to be talking about all that. Genesis 12 reads, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. He's given the Hebrews a whole new calendar. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts um, and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of the raw, uh, any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, with your sandals on your feet, your staff in hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right. It, it, it's important to understand the context of this story. So, so actually, I'm going to give you a backstory first, and that is this. Pharaoh... Just several chapters earlier, earlier, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he asked uh, Moses and Aaron, he said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? In other words, what's so special about your God? I mean, we live in a, we live in a, a world back then, but now too, of countless gods, really, little g gods. And so he says, what's so special about your God? And actually, this story answers that question, perhaps as good as any passage in the entire Bible. And we are introduced in the process to the Passover meal. 
At the center of this Passover meal, oddly, for some offensively, is the bloody death of a helpless little victim. All right, let me give you the context. Let me give you the theme. I've kind of already opened up the context. The context is this. The Hebrews are enslaved. They are living in an oppressed fashion, mistreated in Egypt. But don't get that confused with the theme. The context is slavery. The theme in today's passage is really God, God's power, God's might, God's reputation, God's God's total authority to do what he says he's going to do. That is the theme. Let's understand the context of the story a little further. God had looked on the terrible condition of his people, the Hebrews, their their mistreatment at the hands of Egypt, and he'd called for the release of the people. He had called for Pharaoh to release the Hebrew people, but but Pharaoh had refused repeatedly. uh, and, And so God sent a series of plagues, frogs and flies and gnats and other plagues, boils, and the, turned, turned all their water into blood, and, and, and Pharaoh would briefly say, look, if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll release us from this plague, I'll let your people go. And then they would, God would, would end the plague, and then he would change his mind, heart would be hardened, and he would not let the people go. So time and time, a series of plagues, a series of Pharaoh changing his mind because he was rebelling, pushing, saying, who is this God that I should be called to serve him? And so God brings on all these plagues in an effort to secure the release of his people, uh, the Hebrews, and and all of this, the the plagues and and the drama uh, and the mistreatment, all of it comes to a head in verse 12, which we just read. It says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. A truth, a universal truth, set by God, established by God before the foundation of the earth. The universal truth. If we violate God's design for humankind, because he has designed a a life and and a path for us in which we will thrive, in which we will experience joy, in which we will experience safety energy and and delight but if we violate God's design for you for humankind then there's this breakdown there, there's a breakdown and and, and 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 I unleash in my life when I up when I when I go astray from God's design for humankind when, when I I unleash all sorts of chaos and disintegration and disappointment and illness and trouble that happens naturally When I, am, when I am harsh toward others, when I have every, every ability to, to be gentle toward them, but I'm harsh, I go against this, this design that God has for humankind, I'm, I'm, I, I, I lash out, I'm harsh, that will come back on me with all sorts of chaos. And it may be that I just get punched in the face or I get fired, right? But, but there's this natural sort of, of, of of a response that happens when I violate God's design for humankind. But then there's also, and this is pretty scary, there's also this supernatural sort of chaos at times that is unleashed when we violate the design that God has set for humankind. And we see all sorts of consequences in our world uh, from, from, from humankind veering off from God's 
design. And so, so in this passage uh, is perhaps the most startling of sorts, uh, the supernatural act. Well, verse 25, in, in, we didn't read it, but verse 25 later on in the chapter says that, that a destroyer will come on that night and the Lord will not permit the destroyer to enter the houses of the Hebrews if they put the blood on their doorposts. The one way to protect your home from the destroyer, the supernatural force of, of darkness and evil that will, that, will, that will result in all of the firstborn dying, firstborn males dying, the one way to protect your home, God says, is this little lamb. That's the only way you can face this evil force is kill a helpless little lamb. And I'm sure the Hebrews are like, huh? You, you kill a lamb and you eat it with your family and you put the blood on the doorpost of your home. Now, in order to understand this great exchange, the life of your firstborn child for a little bitty lamb, in order to under, under, uh, understand that great exchange, uh, you have to understand all of the stories of the lamb in the Bible. Again, God says the lamb's life for your firstborn's life. We got to understand the lambs. So let's just kind of review a bit. First of all, let's remember the story we talked about a few weeks ago, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham had waited a long, long, long time for this promised child for Isaac to be born. And finally, Isaac is born. He has Isaac. And then, and then remember, he's marching up Mount Moriah to take the life of his own little boy. And Isaac says to his dad, Dad, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abraham says to his son on that day, the Lord will provide. And he must have said it to himself inside, inside his own heart a hundred times, the Lord will provide. I know he will. The, the Lord will provide. And ultimately we know God stayed the hand of Abraham. Abraham did not kill his son. A lamb was found in the bush. And that's this first example of, a, of an animal, uh, an innocent animal, being placed and, and, and sacrificed in the place of the firstborn child. And then, and then we have today's story, second example of a, of a lamb, a live animal, an innocent live animal, being pushed forward and saying, this is the sacrifice in place of your firstborn male child. Now, there's some other, that's two examples of, uh, we're going to go on with more examples of the lamb in the, uh, in the Old and New Testament, but, but let's stop there for a second and let's say this. What in the, what's the deal with the firstborn male? And here's the significance, I believe. Every firstborn male in that culture represents every family in that culture because families are so intertwined and and this was the representative of the family, the firstborn male. So the firstborn male represents every family in that culture, in that, in that, uh, in that tribe or that nation. But, but even more broadly, every firstborn male historically represents every, every family on the face of the earth. And that represents every individual on the face of the earth. And, and every one of us is weighed down by this debt of sin. And we all, even though we don't like to admit it, all deserve punishment for that sin. And see, in that Hebrew culture, they would have had a, a deeper grasp of the, 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 the firstborn male is really representing us all. He's got the name, he's the namesake, he's got the blessing. And, and, and there's, there, there's this, they knew what's going on here. And, 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 and it's hard for us to, to embrace, because hurdle number one, I don't, I don't want to believe, Pastor Randy, that, that every one of us has this mountain 
of debt called sin that we've accrued that we are responsible for. Well, you may not embrace the Bible as a whole, and I, I respect that if you don't, but, but I'll start there and I'll say, most of us, if not all of us, would say, I don't live up to the Ten Commandments all the time. If we, if we just pared it down a little bit, most of us would, would say, I, I don't live up to the golden rule. I love my neighbors. I love myself. Let me ask you this. If you don't hold to the Bible, if you don't hold to scriptures, if you don't even hold to the golden rule, let me ask you this. What about the standards that you place on everyone else in your life? Do you live up to those standards? I think we all realize that, that we fail, we fall short. What I expect of others, uh, I don't even expect of myself. What I expect of others, um, I, I fall short of that sort of goal expectation all the time. And, and so we're weighed down by this debt of sin as we have offended others, as we have offended God, as we have been offensive according to our own standards that we put on other people. There's just weight of the debt of the wrongdoing that, that, that we've all committed. And the thing about debt, the thing about debt, you either, you either make your wrongdoers pay or, or, or you just pay it yourself and just wipe it off the books. But, but someone always pays. I say that because the second hurdle that's hard to clear when we, when we try to wrap our brains around this faith stuff is the idea that God expects payment to be made for our sin. We say, well, if he's a loving God, why doesn't he just, why doesn't he just forgive it? Why doesn't he just, just, just forget it? Just like sweep it under the rug. Why can't he just forgive it without there having to be a payment? And yet, and yet I think innately we know when a serious, serious wrong has been committed, I mean like a serious, uh, like a serial killer. When that serial killer is caught and convicted, if, if we just said, you know, he said he was sorry. I mean, he seems sorry. Let's just let him off. Then that would be offensive. We would say that the victims have paid with their lives. They, they had to pay. He didn't have to pay because he was, if you let him off, then society pays, we might say. But, but someone has to pay the debt when a real tragic wrong is done. If you've ever been wronged, if you've ever been abused or mistreated, I, I think you get this point. I think you get the idea that that in forgiveness, someone has to pay. When you look at your abuser, your perpetrator, when you look him in the eye and you say, now you're forgiven, but you need to understand, this is not cheap. This is costing me. Like There's a lot of sacrifice that has to go on inside here. When you forgive uh, somebody that's really done you wrong, you, you get that. I mean, it's not a cheap sort of forgiveness. You either, they, either they're going to pay, and they're going to pay every penny, penny, uh, on that debt or in your forgiveness, there's sacrifice that you have to make. But someone has to pay. Someone has to pay. Pastor Tim Keller, he, he speaks to that. Somebody has to pay when he says, if it's true that even we, in spite of our rhetoric, we cannot avoid that, there's no such thing as a wrong that can just be forgiven without somebody paying, if even we, with our imperfect and fuzzy moral senses, if, uh, if we sense that, how much more will God sense that at a cosmic level? Yeah, at a cosmic, universal level. There is this truth that, that for, for, for sin to be forgiven, the debt, the penalty has to be paid. It just has to be. It's just how God has designed 
the universe. So we see this penalty, this, 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 this sin being placed on the little lamb. We see it uh, just as a symbol. We see it with the ram in the story of, Adam, uh, of, of Abraham and Isaac. We, we see it in this, this little lamb in the story of the Passover where, where God says, the, you, 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 you put your sins on uh, this, this little lamb. I mean, you, you kill the lamb and the lamb's life will be sacrificed in place of the firstborn. We, we see this story, but it's just the unfolding of ultimately the gospel story. It's just a symbol, a picture of ultimately what Jesus is going to do. Now, I want to I point something out about the, the really equality of the Egyptians dead of sin, the, the Hebrews, dead of sin, and, and our dead of sin. You see, you see, it's not about the Hebrews good, the Egyptians bad. It's really not. In fact, if the Hebrews had left their homes that night, what would have happened? With Genesis 12, uh, going on later on, verse 21, it says, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, Kill the Passover lamb, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And then here it is. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You see, if the Hebrews had left their homes and ventured out into the night, they too would have been smitten, would have been killed. If they wouldn't have put the blood on the door, on the, on the doorpost, on the lintel, then, then, then the death wouldn't have passed over. It would have visited their home as well, and I really, I know, it's, I know it's morbid, I know it's hard to get your arms around, but, but here's, here's what I love about that. Here's what God is saying at an early stage in the Bible. He's saying to the Hebrews, his chosen people, he's saying, you are no less guilty than the Egyptians. You too have a debt of sin that you owe. You are no less guilty than the Egyptians. However, you are covered by this blood and that makes all the difference. The blood of the Lamb. Ultimately, the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, For Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. That's where this is all going. That's where the story of the Bible is all pointing. Forward, backward, toward Jesus, the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Third lamb story in the Bible, Jesus. You see that Passover meal that had, that had taken place there in haste in Egypt that they'd carried with them all through their 40 years of wandering in the, in the wilderness? The Hebrews, ultimately, they took it to their new land, to the promised land, and it was an established part of their culture for hundreds of of years and Jesus is born into that culture and in the night of his betrayal and arrest he says to his his his, uh, his 12 friends he says I have earnestly longed to share this meal with you I have earnestly longed it's it's a double positive he's saying how much have I longed to share this meal, the Passover meal, with you, my friends, this night before he goes to the cross? Why is he doing that? Well, look at the beautiful picture teaching that he, that he, that he provides. He, he celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples on that night, the night of his betrayal, but there are two, just two incredible facts that you might want to dispute, but two incredible facts that are just hard to get around. Number one, there is no lamb mentioned. 
I mean, usually when you have a Passover meal, you have unleavened bread and you have wine and you have the lamb. The lamb that's slaughtered, you have the roast lamb. But in this story, there's no mention. In the Gospels, there's no mention of a lamb. This is the Passover meal. Jesus holds up the bread. He holds up the cup. No lamb. Which leads to the second startling fact. And that, and that is that on that night, Jesus explains, I am the lamb. I am the sacrifice. I have earnestly desired to share this meal with you for some time now because I want this to make so much sense to you, he says to, my, to his friends. I want you to understand the lamb's not here tonight, but the lamb is here tonight. I am the sacrifice. From now on, when you do this, when you break this bread, when you drink from this cup, do this remembering me. I am the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. This is the culmination of all of human history through which God has been moving freely for centuries. And now it's unfolded. It's unfolded. Now it makes sense. God is, on that night, God the Father is beginning that walk up the mountain. Like Abraham, God is now walking up the mountain with his son. He lays the wood on him. He, 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 he takes that lonely walk up the hill toward the cross with him, but no one stops him. No one says, lay down the knife. Because God is the ultimate authority. And God is determined. I will sacrifice my son to pay the debt, the penalty of sin for my children. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? And the father is silent. Because he has a plan. It's, it's a plan that he formulated before the foundation of the earth, the Apostle Paul tells us. He saves us. He redeems us. He buys us back. He pays the penalty of our sin with the very sacrifice of his own son. There's one more lamb story. Let's look at that now. The last story of the Lamb, at least for today, <clears throat> is in the book of Revelation. It talks about things to come, things that will happen one day. And it's a picture of heaven. And, and, and the angel says in heaven, the angel says, who is worthy to open the scroll and, and read from it that we might know who, who the children of God really are? Who is, who is worthy and able to unroll the scroll? And, and, and there's crying and there's weeping and say, because they, they don't, who could possibly be worthy? No one, we're all unworthy. And then in this, in this epic story in Revelation 5, out from behind the throne of God comes the lamb who's been slain, clearly has been slain. And yet he, he moves around the throne and every, they lose it. They lose their minds and they say, there he is, the Lamb of God. He is worthy to open the scroll. And then they cry out and, the, and here's what you can look forward to in heaven, this sort of epic party. They cry out, worthy are you to take the scroll. They're, they're talking to this little lamb who's just come around the legs of the throne and they're crying out and say, worthy are you. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. By your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom. You've made them a priest to our God. And they shall reign on earth. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We, we see we see pictures of him, Abraham in Egypt, the Passover lamb 
at, at, before the crucifixion. We see him on the cross. We see him in the book of Revelation. He's just undeniable. He, is, he has come to save you, to rescue you, to redeem you. And so, so in the words of John the Baptist, John the Baptist, the day he first laid eyes on Jesus there uh, down at the river, and he says, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does he, what does he, what does he invite us to do? He invite, behold. It's as though he's saying, Mira, 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 look, look at him, look at him. And so that's what I invite you to do today, to, to, to gaze on the beauty of the story of Jesus, who, who he is, what he has done for us. The, it's not possible to make too big a deal out of Jesus. He is the central theme of the Bible. His redemption, his act on the cross is what binds us together. And that is why we come together each and every week. Even in this age of pandemic, that's why we come together and celebrate communion because it is the hub of the wheel and everything that we do revolves around the name and the fame of Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of of the world. He offers you that salvation today, my friend. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. All right, friends. Well, that's it as far as the teaching series. But as soon as I, this video stops, you're going to go into the really important time of celebrating communion right there in your home by yourself, uh, with your family, with your friends. I invite you, encourage you to linger, to take some time today, talk, celebrate, maybe even sing as you remember and celebrate the goodness of Jesus and his work on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Hey, if you need something, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. If you need to know more about the church, riverchurchrgv.com. All things River Church can be found there. If you're ready to give, uh, it, that's a great opportunity. Giving online, elect uh, electronically is a great way to support the ministry of this church. You can go to the website and you can give. It's safe, it's intuitive, it's quick. Um, so I, I thank you for those of you who do give generously to River Church. It allows us to continue this ministry. Okay, well, now I invite you to move into your time of communion. I love you, I'm, I'm praying for you, and I, I look forward to seeing you soon.